Good morning and welcome to a House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations and Global Corporate Social Impact Hybrid Hearing. In accordance with House rules and regulations, the host will mute all participants. Please keep yourself muted when not speaking. If you do not remember to, to mute yourself after speaking, the host will do so to limit background audio. Timekeeper will monitor the time for this hearing. For submission of documents during this hearing, please email hfac.com repository at mail.house.gov. As a reminder, members must have their video on to be recognized. With that, Chair Castro, please count down from five and pause so the system recognizes your video and we are ready to begin. Thank you. Five, four, three, two, one. The Subcommittee on International Development, International Organizations, and Global Corporate Social Impact will come to order. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to our witness for being here today for this hearing entitled Personalist Policy, UN Elections and U.S. Leadership in International Organizations. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record, subject to the length limitation in our rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the document to the previously mentioned address or contact subcommittee staff. As a reminder to members joining remotely, please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with the HRES 8 and the accompanying regulations, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they're not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I also ask members who are present in the hearing room to keep their masks on when they're not speaking. I see that we have a quorum and will now recognize myself for opening remarks. Uh, pursuant to notice, we're holding a hearing today on the United States engagement with the United Nations and other international organizations, upcoming leadership elections at the UN, and the Biden administration's policies to more effectively engage with these multilateral bodies. After the Second World War, the United States worked with our allies and adversaries to create the United Nations the entity that is at the foundation of today's international system. Much of the world's diplomacy is centered around the United Nations and its various component agencies and offices. The work at the United Nations today covers everything from nuclear nonproliferation to human rights to the standards that determine how technology will be developed. It is essential that the United States stays deeply engaged with the UN to preserve and advance our interests within this international system using diplomacy and negotiation instead of conflict and coercion. I call this hearing today to understand from the administration and the State Department how they will, how they will do that, including when it comes to key elections to UN bodies. We know what it looks like when the United States approach isn't well coordinated, and I'll give you an example of that. The heads of UN bodies are determined by elections where member states build coalitions and support candidates that reflect their values. In 2019, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization was scheduled to elect its director general, someone who would have a key role in setting international policy on agriculture and food security. The United States, under the last administration, approached this critical election without a clear strategy or goal. Not only did we split with our European allies, Reports indicate that the State Department and the Department of Agriculture, both agencies that work with the Food and Agriculture Organization, weren't on the same page on which candidate to back. Ultimately, the government of China was able to get one of its senior government officials elected to the office, a serious setback for the United States and for our European allies and allies around the world. The lessons of this experience are why I'm encouraged to see the Biden administration and the Blinken State Department make concrete efforts to better coordinate our work in international organizations. This year, the State Department created the new Office of Multilateral Strategy and Personnel that will coordinate the actions of the United States on these elections. I'm also encouraged to see the administration's early and vocal support of Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin's candidacy to lead the International Telecommunications Union during the upcoming fall 2022 elections. I had the opportunity to meet with Ms. Bogdan Martin recently and believe she would be an effective leader of the ITU, an organization where major decisions on standards and technology are set. Other major elections are looming, including for the International Labor Organization, the World Health Organization, 
Interpol, and others. I hope to hear from the administration on their approaches to these contests as well. I would also like to hear from the administration on what they'll do to expand the use of tools like the Junior Professional Officer Program, which allows countries to sponsor young professionals to work at the United Nations, or the use of existing authorities to allow U.S. federal government employees to be detailed to international organizations. I believe the State Department should be proactive in identifying where these opportunities are, building awareness of them within the rest of the department and with other federal agencies, and coordinating the placement of these individuals. We've seen some federal agencies, such as the Center for Disease Control, make good use of these authorities to place employees in international organizations, but these efforts across the federal government are uneven and inconsistent. We need a more strategic approach that the State Department can provide. This year, I introduced the Restoring U.S. Leadership in International Organizations Act of 2021. The legislation would strengthen the State Department's ability to do just that. And I'm glad that key parts of the bill are now included in this committee's Eagle Act, which is currently being debated by the Congress. The President will convene a summit for democracy this December, which will kick off a year of action to advance democratic values. In the spirit of advancing democratic values, it's essential that the United States does everything we can to ensure that international organizations do not become the means by which authoritarian powers entrench their policies. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ranking Member Maliotakis for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman, for calling this important hearing. I look forward to working with you and the rest of the committee members to conduct important oversight of our engagement with the United Nations and other international organizations. Ambassador, thank you for being here and for your service with the State Department. Um, this hearing comes at a pivotal time. In recent years, we have seen the United States-led international order challenged. As rogue states like China and Russia seek to advance their authoritarian agendas and undermine sovereignty in places like Ukraine and the South China Sea. As we saw in the early stages of COVID-19, international organizations often oppose our national interest. The World Health Organization routinely parroted Chinese Communist Party talking points, which conflict with statements made by their own experts, leaving the American people exposed to the havoc that COVID-19 would wreak on our nation. Instead of serving the American people who fund them, the bureaucrats at the WHO continuously kowtow to President Xi and his cronies, genocidal actors whose goal is to remake the world in their communist image. China's bad behavior has not been limited to the WHO. They have consistently sought to exclude Taiwan from international organizations in general, including the International Civ uh, Civil Aviation Organization. And during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, ICAO, which was then headed by a Chinese national, blocked users on Twitter who requested Taiwan be allowed to participate in COVID-19 response efforts at the organization. Those blocked included think tank analysts and journalists. Such behavior is exemplary of China's approach to Taiwan's participation in international organizations. The United Nations and international organizations more broadly often oppose our national interests. Last month, the United States was elected to the UN Human Rights Council, a fundamentally corrupt body with a track record of protecting dictatorships and covering up the crimes of the world's worst human rights abusers. It is astounding that China, Russia, Venezuela, Cuba, all have seats at the table at the supposed shrine of human rights in Geneva. It's laughable. Nicolas Maduro, dictator in Venezuela, was speaking at the opening session earlier this year. And additionally, the council has focused its efforts on persecuting Israel, the only country permanently featured on the council's agenda as its own item. This administration has done nothing to drive real reform at the council. These reforms should have been a prerequisite for the U.S. re-engaging with the council, something that I had suggested time and again, let alone seeking election to it, not a lofty goal left to be achieved sometime in the future. The same can be said for the President's decision to unilaterally rejoin the Paris Agreement on Climate Change without congressional consultation. 
while costing Americans trillions of dollars, the agreements permit the world's largest carbon emitter, China, to make meager contributions. Under the agreement, the CCP may con continue raising carbon emissions until 2030, destroying our environment and contributing to climate change every step of the way. When the United Nations engages with the United, uh, when the United States engages with the United Nations, its agencies, or other international organizations, we bring not only our values but also our financial contributions. The U.S. accounts for roughly one quarter of both the regular and peacekeeping budgets at the United Nations. Yet our influence rarely measures up to our contributions. Chairman Castro, I look forward to working with you to conduct rigorous oversight on U.S. engagement with the United Nations and other international organizations. We have a duty to the American taxpayer to ensure that our engagement with these institutions is targeted, strategic, and advances America first interests abroad. Otherwise, we are wasting our time and our constituents' money. Again, I want to thank the witness for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Ranking Member. I'll now introduce our distinguished witness with us today. Our witness is Ambassador Erica Barks Ruggles, the Senior Bureau Official at the State Department of State's Bureau of International Organization Affairs. She's a career Foreign Service Officer who previously served as a U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Rwanda. She's also served as the U.S. Consul General in Cape Town, South Africa, as Deputy U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations. And I'll now recognize our witness for five minutes, and without objection, uh, your prepared written statements will be made part of the record. Ambassador Barsh Ruggles, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Castro, Ranking Member Maliotakis, and the members of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee uh, on International Organizations uh, for having me here today. Under the Biden-Harris administration, the United States has reengaged vigorously on the multilateral stage to support key U.S. priorities. We've rejoined the Paris Agreement, we've recommitted to the World Health Organization, and we've been reelected to the Human Rights Council. But U.S. leadership in the U.N. system involves more than simply signing on to existing institutions or reengaging with U.N. bodies. We are leading with the power of our example, rekindling old alliances and forging new partnerships. For example, the United States is by far the largest single country contributor to COVAX, and we're making hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine available without political strings attached. At the UN climate change conference that ended recently, the United States showed a whole of government response to the climate crisis, and we are mobilizing the necessary investment in technologies to promote good jobs in the United States while growing a prosperous net zero emissions economy in the US and globally. We must ensure that the UN system, as a key global platform in all of these efforts, is strong and resilient and able to uphold the fundamental values of democracy, justice, transparency, and respect for individual human rights. We are committed to ensuring that the UN has the skilled, well-qualified, and capable leadership and personnel it needs to respond to global challenges. One of the I.O. Bureau's core responsibilities is to lead the State Department's efforts in the appointment and election of qualified, independent U.S. and like-minded candidates to leadership positions throughout the U.N. system. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, this is critical to ensure the U.N. operates effectively and bolsters reform and good governance that the ranking member has underlined as so important. Thanks to funding that Congress provided earlier this year, our Bureau stood up the Office of Multilateral Strategy and Personnel, known by an acronym, of course, as IO slash MSP, to reinforce U.S. leadership and priorities, including on priority elections and appointments. IO MSP coordinates with the rest of the department to ensure the administration advances an affirmative agenda that revitalizes and expands partnerships in support of a rules-based international order. This includes countering the efforts of countries such as the People's Republic of China and Russia to reshape and undermine international law, institutions, and standards. Since April 2021, the U.S. has won five U.N. elections, including a seat on the Human Rights Council and electing independent American experts to the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Committee Against Torture, 
the International Narcotics Control Board, and the International Civil Service Commission. Looking ahead, a top U.S. government priority is the candidacy of Ms. Doreen Bogdan Martin, who is running against a Russian candidate to become the next Secretary General of the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU. With three decades of experience in the telecom sector, Ms. Bogdan Martin would be the first woman to head the ITU in its 156-year history if she is elected. Her election would also help expand universal connectivity and uphold an open and multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance against state-led models urged by some authoritarian nations. In addition to leadership positions, IO promotes U.S. employment in the U.N. system more broadly, including through expanding the opportunities for Americans in the U.N.'s junior officer, junior professional officer program, known as the JPO program, and broadening outreach to all Americans interested in a U.N. career. We appreciate the JPO funding that has been provided through the IOMP account. This funding is currently restricted, however, to positions only within the UN Secretariat, and we look forward to working with Congress to expand our JPO efforts more broadly through the UN system. IO has also funded technology-based solutions to ensure that we use the best and most current data to manage elections and personnel and to make decisions in the future. With congressional support, we are planning to build customized databases and analytic tools to manage multilateral elections, organize U.S. employment efforts, and track U.N. member states' voting histories to improve U.S. negotiating expertise and inform policymaking. While personnel is paramount, the Department also scrutinizes draft resolutions and other documents to ensure they reflect international values, not the ideology of foreign policy initiatives of individual states. When we see language that runs counter to U.S. interests, U.N. values, or international law, we coordinate engagements with other countries to contest that. We also support Taiwan's meaningful participation throughout the UN system, including at the WHO and, the, and in ICAO. In short, we are back to make sure that the UN advances the interests of the United States and the American people. I thank you for your interest in, this, in these issues and the opportunity to appear today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ambassador, for your testimony, and thank you for helping us lead the world again. I'll now recognize members for five minutes each, and pursuant to House rules, all time yielded is for the purposes of questioning our witnesses. Uh, because of the hybrid format of this hearing, I will recognize members by committee seniority, alternating between the majority and the minority. If you miss your turn, please let our staff know, and we'll recognize you, or we'll circle back to you. Uh, if you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally. And I'll start by recognizing myself, but actually, as I, before I do, uh, for the members, uh, uh, especially the folks that are on video, uh, please be sure to watch the five-minute timer so that we can keep our questions uh, to five minutes, you know, within a few seconds or whatever. And since we only have one witness, we may actually have time for a second round of questions, uh, again, if time permits. So I'll start by recognizing myself. Ambassador, the United States' work with international organizations runs across the State Department and across multiple federal agencies, as you know. Over two dozen parts of the U.S. government provide funding to different international organizations and individual bureaus at the State Department handle policy towards different organizations. I think it's important to make sure that the State Department plays the key role when it comes to foreign affairs. And by that, I mean uh, the State Department, not DHS, not DOJ, uh, or another agency. How will the State Department make sure that U.S. policy across the federal government is coordinated when it comes to elections and placement? And will the State Department set up an interagency mechanism to streamline that coordination? Uh, and can you describe your outreach efforts to build awareness of the opportunities for federal employees to be detailed to international organizations and what barriers do you see in fully using that authority? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your question. Uh, the State Department is indeed in the lead on our efforts uh, in international organizations, and the, with the help of this Congress and the, uh, the setting up of the IOMSP office, uh, we have reinforced that effort over the course of the last nine months. Uh, this has been an important effort because it has required everybody to be more coordinated within the State Department, but also in the interagency, and it has allowed us to recapture the leadership effort 
um, to make sure that we are coordinated. So let me give you a couple of examples. Our IOMSP office, and I, I have our new director here with me today, Mr. Andy Shaw, um, has, has set up several units, one of which is on the strategic competition side. Uh, working to develop and implement efforts to address strategic competition across the UN system, whether that be language, access for Taiwan, um, and, and also making sure that we are placing people in correct positions throughout the UN system. A second uh, unit is working on electoral campaigns for US officials um, and US American citizens across the system. And so this uh, unit has done things like, um, I brought some examples today, um, producing campaign materials, including for Ms. Bogdan Martin, I have also her pin, and I'm happy to, to, to share those with folks, um, to make sure that we are putting forth, um, at an early stage, our efforts on electoral uh, campaigns, um, and to strongly back with the backing of the entire American government, not just the State Department. We have the Commerce Department, we have uh, uh, our private sector working with us to make sure that we have a coordinated, well-managed uh, campaign uh, for Ms. Bogdan Martin and for our candidates across the UN system. And then a third area is the placement of UN's US citizens um, from the JPO level, the very junior uh, professional officer level throughout. Um, so we have um, put in place uh, a uh, standard operating procedures about how we advertise UN positions that are available. Uh, so they are, those are now publicly available. We link to the UN system, and we are working with folks who are interested and applying for jobs to make sure that we are advocating for them. If they are Americans who are applying for jobs and, and, we, and they make themselves known to us, we are then advocating for their placement in the UN system. Um, whether they're coming from inside the government or coming from the private sector. We make sure they're well qualified. Um, we make sure that they have, uh, they have the requisite uh, expertise for the job they're applying for. But we are also working with other agencies. So if it's a law enforcement position, with the DOJ. If it's for something in, the A in FAO, we make sure that agriculture is aware of those citizens and is working with us to make sure that they, are, they get those placements. Um, so this is the beginning, uh, not the end, but uh, we appreciate the support and we look forward to working with this committee to strengthen that effort. Great, and you may have to take part of the next question for the record because I only got about 45 seconds left, but I support the administration's decision to create this office of multilateral strategy and personnel where you have, where you've asked for the funding for five staff positions. Uh, this is in contrast to the efforts before that drew down the number of State Department employees with this portfolio to zero. Uh, so what's the status of this office getting set up and operational, and what are its early priorities? And do you have any constraints when it comes to authorities or funding for the office to effectively do its job? We got like 10 seconds, so maybe so for the just record. Just very we'll briefly, uh, we are hiring now for the office. When it is fully staffed, it will have 15 members. Um, plus a deputy assistant secretary. We're about half staffed at this point, and we look forward to filling the rest of those positions shortly. Wonderful, thank you. I now recommend, recognize Ranking Member Malia Takis for her questions. Uh, thank you. Ambassador, part of the frustration of the American people is that they feel our country is making bad deals that put us at a disadvantage. Uh, you mentioned three things that the Biden administration has done since taking uh, office re-entering the Paris Accord, re-entering WHO, and re-entering the UN Human Rights Council. However, they did so enter the Paris Accord without demanding a level playing field from China or India. They re-entered this accord without any changes that would give America an advantage, or at least a level playing field. With regards to the World Health Organization, they didn't even demand an investigation into the origins and you know, as, as evidence points to the Wuhan lab and more Americans want accountability, the president said he was gonna do a 90-day review and then nothing happened after that. It was just, uh, you know, kicking the can down the road. With regards to the UN Human Rights Council, um, there was no plan to eliminate bad actors on the council and I, I still don't hear a plan from this administration on how we're gonna get rid of those egregious human rights violators, Russia, China, Cuba, Venezuela. So. The question is, why should the American people have faith that their, our participation and their tax dollars that 
significantly fund, fund the majority of the funding in these organizations, are gonna be used, utilized in a strategic manner when we are giving away the store, we're going back to the negotiation that we saw under uh, President Obama, Obama, giving away our leverage, giving away our funding without getting anything in return, at least any commitments that level the playing field, if not at, you know, going to put America first. Thank you, Ranking Member, for your question. Um, uh, let me address first the Human Rights Council. This is a, a body which we share your concerns about. Uh, the membership is far from perfect, uh, and it contains some of uh, very problematic countries that have gross human rights abusers on the council. Um, we agree that we need to work hard to improve that membership. We have been working with like-minded allies um, to recruit better candidates, because the candidate pool has to be better in order to get folks elected. Um, and we agree with you that that is something that we need to focus on and that we will be focusing on as we move forward. Um, we also agree uh, that there are, is, are reform efforts that are needed. We have seen when we are not present, however, that it creates a vacuum that has actually made the situation worse. Um, we have seen rising uh, language uh, pushed by authoritarian governments in a number of resolutions which have undermined the individual human rights values on which the very council is founded. Uh, so we need to be present to fight for those values, to fight for American democratic values um, and individual human rights, um, but also to improve the council. And we believe that that's important. I'll briefly address the WHO. We agree uh, that, that the initial uh, response to the pandemic globally should have been better and could have been better. Um, we have pushed very hard for the WHO to undertake a rigorous scientific-based uh, investigation into the origins of COVID. Uh, the, and we were quite critical of the first origins report, which was published in April. Uh, we are pleased that the WHO since then has launched a uh, follow-up origins two investigation effort um, we, that is based on science. They have uh, put together uh, a SAGO, which is a group of experts, um, scientific, ba scientific experts from around the world to look at the origins the second, in this second report, and we are pushing for that to go forward. Uh, well, I hope uh, they will take a, a much stronger approach than what we've seen, both against the Human Rights Council, because I've not seen anything from the ambassador truly speaking out against the egregious violations of those countries that sit on this Human Rights Council. It obviously makes it a farce, this council, and we need to reform it, and I, I would like to see more speaking in, in, in support of that. Um, and also, with who? I mean, it's so critically important that this administration gets serious about working in with the international partners to get to the bottom, so number one, we could prevent it from happening again, but also, we can push back on this rhetoric from the communist Chinese party that was seeing, you know, saying that now this virus, uh, they're saying, is, was, was uh, created in a U.S. Army base in Maryland. You know, it's outrageous, and we need to play a stronger role. We cannot allow these bad actors to get away with this, and I appreciate it. would love to hear more about the Paris Accord next round. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. Uh, next we have the vice chair of our committee, Sarah Jacobs, Congresswoman Jacobs. Uh, well, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, um, and uh, I really appreciate you putting a uh, hosting this uh, hearing as an American who worked at the UN, I can tell you that we are few and far between in that uh, organization and it would be great to get more folks in there. Um, as was mentioned in the chair's testimony, uh, in, in the witnesses' testimony, uh, we have the International Telecommunication Union um, vote coming up for the next Secretary General. Um, I actually know Doreen Bogdan Martin, we worked together when I was at UNICEF and, and running uh, an organization. Um, and I think she's wonderful. She has three decades of experience um, and the stakes are clearly very high. Um, but Ambassador Bark struggles. I was hoping if you could just for the record explain for the committee why this election is so important. Thank you very much, Member Jacobs. Uh, the, the election to the ITU is critically important because the ITs, you, ITU's work and mandate are important to US defense, to space, to development and to our economic interests. 
Uh, this campaign has broad interagency support because of that. Um, the, the ITU is uh, partly responsible for internet and telecommunications governance. It's, it was set up 156 years ago, well before the UN itself, um, to, uh, to allocate uh, bandwidth across uh, telecommunications. Uh, that is, is still part of its primary purpose and is absolutely essential when you look at Wi-Fi infrastructure and telecommunications infrastructure on which our economy depends. This is an absolutely critical institution and we need to have a leader who reflects our values but who also will help uh, ensure that development of telecoms across the globe is based on a multi-stakeholder approach uh, with the values of openness, transparency, and efficiency uh, that we need to see to make this, uh, this sector uh, as efficient and as uh, transparent as possible for the benefit of our companies as well as for the benefit of those uh, who, of our allies, friends, and uh, uh, partners around the world. Well, thank you. And how can Congress best help the State Department uh, in this election? Thank you. As Representative Castro has said, as Chairman Castro has said, um, I, I know a number of members of Congress have already met with um, Ms. Bogdan Martin, and she will be uh, coming back to meet with other members of Congress. Um, we think it's important to highlight why the ITU matters, um, and also to work with the private sector to make sure that they are involved uh, in this. I know that members of Congress uh, have been extremely supportive of her election, um, and we look forward to working with you as we move forward with her campaign uh, and making sure that the American people understand why this matters. Well, thank you so much, and please count my office uh, in to help with whatever we can do. I wanted to switch uh, uh, topics a little bit. Uh, a recent article in the Journal of Democracy found that China has used its seat on the UN Economic and Social Council's Committee on NGOs to block applications from civil society organizations seeking consultative status um, to participate in important UN activities like gaining access to sessions and speaking at events. Um, these activities are very critical to make sure that civil society's voice is heard and consulted when really big decisions are being made. So we've talked a lot about electing good candidates to prevent these kinds of situations, but what else can be done at the UN to mitigate or prevent this misuse of a UN seat? And what else have you seen this type of behavior by China or other countries? Yeah, this is, this is one of those places where uh, uh, nefarious things can happen because it, it's fairly obscure. The ECOSOC NGO Committee's current membership is unfortunately not great and is uh, fairly hostile to NGOs, reflecting a global trend that restricts civil society space uh, in international organizations. Um, we have serious concerns about uh, restriction of civil society and we've been pushing very hard uh, with the UN Secretariat and in the committee uh, and with other allies to make sure that we walk back those efforts and ensure that the committee's work is open, transparent, and accessible to civil society and that the UN is open, transparent, and accessible to civil society. We were pleased that just yesterday the new president of the General Assembly held an open meeting uh, with members of civil society and has pledged that they will have uh, renewed access uh, post-COVID uh, starting in January of next year to the UN headquarters building as they had had before. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate all of your work on that. And uh, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. We'll now go to uh, Representative Houlihan. Really? No, I think you should go to Mr. Issa, sir. Oh, I didn't see, Daryl, I didn't see you on the video. There you are, all right. First, we're gonna go to Daryl Issa. He was he was off video for a second, please. Yeah, no problem. I, uh, uh, I've always thought every time I take a sip of coffee, I should probably be off video. But uh, Ambassador, thank you so much for giving us so much of your time today. I'm gonna focus on the free people of Taiwan. Uh, as you know all too well, uh, when, Richard Nixon made the decision to recognize mainland China rather than two Chinas. He made a decision to switch uh, the recognition from one country to another. Uh, what has effectively happened as a result is with only a couple of exceptions, uh, no one recognizes Taiwan as an independent country. And those who continue to 
Uh, China has used its vaccine and other techniques to essentially bribe slash extort uh, or attempt to extort a change in recognition. Uh, it, that's at the same time as they're building islands uh, threatening both Taiwan and likely Japan and the other countries in the region. Uh, in your testimony, you, you said you wanted to support Taiwan. Uh, currently, Taiwan is, is treated as a non-citizen at the WHO and a host of other uh, UN uh, activities. Uh, they clearly do not get, uh, which by the way includes the access to vaccine, they do not get treated as, uh, if you will, part of China by China. Uh, what specifically will you be doing to ensure access to the free people of Taiwan uh, to uh, standing as necessary in agencies, particularly since it's very clear that China does not share if you ask them to uh, help Taiwan? Thank you for your important question. Uh, we will continue uh, the U.S. policy of supporting Taiwan's meaningful participation in the UN and its related organizations. We are working closely with friends and allies on this issue to facilitate their ability to contribute to efforts on public health at the WHA and in other health organizations, through in law enforcement efforts, in civil aviation safety, and on other issues. Um, we also are, are concerned in three areas. One, access. We believe that, that Taiwan's uh, citizens uh, should have access to UN buildings, UN headquarters, and be able to contribute. Um, and we continue to press for that to, to happen. We are also concerned about nomenclature and efforts to change uh, the way that Taiwan is referred to in UN documents, and we will continue to push back on that. And as I said, we will continue to press for Taiwan to have meaningful participation in areas where its expertise and experiences can, can, can contribute um, to responses to things like pandemics, um, but also to aviation safety around the world. Thank you, Ambassador. And just following up, uh, you know, you use the term uh, appropriately, you will continue as previous administrations, uh, but each administration has seen more threats to uh, uh, to Taiwan. Uh, as you know, Taiwan represents as much as 80% of the supply chain of integrated circuits chips to the United States and similar amounts to many other countries of the world. Do you believe, and I, I know policy is always difficult to say on the fly, but do you believe that the United States has an obligation to use the United Nations in order to spell out or reiterate the uh, uh, the prohibition on the taking of, of China, either directly militarily or through economic coercion by China, uh, and is the United Nations isn't the United Nations an appropriate venue to uh, bolster that that security rather than simply sending our fleets uh, to confront uh, China in the Strait? Thank you. I, there, there are a number of different venues where we have spoken very plainly and very recently about uh, the, our commitment to Taiwan security, and I think I will let those statements stand for themselves. I think they are important, and we will continue uh, to press on our consistent policy in defense of Taiwan. And I guess lastly, uh, specifically at the WHO, uh, what reforms, uh, if you're able to maneuver, uh, you know, the United States having influence over China, would you would you bring about to uh, to prevent the kind of misinformation we saw from the WHO during the early parts of the pandemic? You can take that one for the record, uh, Mr. I see your time's up, but we're going to have a second round. So, thank you. Uh huh. Uh, we'll go to Representative Houlihan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my questions, uh, my first question has to do with earlier this year, I reintroduced legislation to authorize an annual U.S. contribution to the UNFPA or the United Nations Population Fund and with more than 100 of my colleagues as co-sponsors to that uh, legislation. And I'm really happy to see that the Biden administration committed to and restored funding to the UNFPA after the prior administration ended its support. 
The previous administration was not the first GOP administration to end support for UNFPA, despite its important work in supporting women and girls around the world. I was wondering if you might be able to speak to the consequences of the inconsistency of U.S. contributions to international organizations like the UNFPA, particularly in the context of it, the increased influ influence of authoritarian countries. And I was wondering how do uh, periodic halts in the U.S. UNFPA dues impact broader U.S. personnel and policymaking objectives? Thank you, Representative Houlihan, and thank you again to Congress for your support. Uh, for UN institutions and for these Im important efforts. Uh, the, as you know, we have been strongly supportive of the UNFPA as well as uh, ensuring that women, girls, and gender issues um, are clearly addressed throughout the UN system, whether that's in UNICEF, uh, in UNFPA, in the UN Human Rights Council, and in other organizations, because we believe that women's rights are human rights and women's development is global development. Uh, so we appreciate very much your, your support. Um, we believe that the U U.S. has enduring and long-term interests in international institutions and the multilateral system, and uh, we appreciate very much this committee's support for continuing and long-term support for the U.N. because we believe that when we are present, and we have seen that when we are present, that the U.S. can and does lead uh, in making policy, in ensuring that uh, U.S. values are embedded in uh, U.N. policies and in U.N. institutions. When we are not present, uh, there are authoritarian states who fill that vacuum. And that is not in our interests, not in our security interests, not in our national interests, not in our economic interests. So we think it's important for us to be present and it's important for us to be leading. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I, uh, of course, agree. My second question has to do with STEM and, and technology and that general space and about the status of a new technology that I understand is under development. You mentioned in your opening statements the importance of technology-based solutions to complement your office's multilateral engagement. And as an engineer and STEM advocate myself, I'm really interested in learning more about this initiative and about the potential for customized databases and analytical tools that support negotiations, multilateral elections, and American citizen engagement and employment, which is from your opening statement. Could you elaborate on the technological improvements that you've re referenced and what is the status and timeline, and how will this improve your office? Office's mission and in increase American citizens' uh, engagement. Thank you. Uh, Thank yes, we are working um, is still at the very beginning stages. Um, we've only just, I believe it was about four weeks ago, um, brought on the first staff members uh, in our new office, uh, uh, IOMSP, looking at, the, at uh, how do we track elections, how do we uh, track voting, how do we make sure that we have constant uh, efforts to, to uh, get that data in a format that is usable, not just for our bureau, but throughout the interagency so that we can better coordinate on elections, that we can better coordinate on policies, and we can better coordinate on vote campaigns. Um, so we are at the beginning stages of that. I would say our, our projected timeline to build out that office and build out that capability is over the next year to 18 months. And what we would like to do then is have that be a constant. Um, so you'll see in our budget request for uh, FY22 that we have included a small allocation uh, for that effort. Uh, and we believe that it is important for us to be able to build on that uh, as we go forward. And so uh, we hope to see that included in the future as well, um, because we think it is important to be able to track this over time, which is something that we haven't done as consistently as we would like to. And so with the final seconds of my time, that uh, leads into my very last question. Other than the funding that you've requested, is there any other barriers or, or uh, anything else that we can be doing to be helpful? Thank you. We, we have uh, a, a number of requests in, in our budget proposal uh, for both personnel as well as uh, resources for that. And your support for those um, is very important to us. Thank you. I appreciate your time. And I yield back, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Houlihan. We'll now go to Representative Tenney. Uh, thank you, Chairman Castro, and thank you for convening this meeting. Thank you also to our ranking member. Uh, when international organizations work effectively, and the United States is rightly their biggest supporter, 
but far too many of these organizations have lost sight of their intended missions, and some fail to even advance American interests, as many of these institutions, mainly UN entities, are increasingly being led and staffed by nationals of countries that are U.S. competitors and adversaries, particularly China and Russia. Uh, we not only need to strengthen U.S. leadership in these organizations, but also ensure they are transparent, effective, and actually advance the causes of liberty and rules-based order. This isn't anything new. I worked at a foreign consulate, and uh, this was something that you know, was going to be around for a while. Which brings me to my first question. Uh, despite some success by the United States, the UN still lacks the appropriate levels of financial transparency and reporting on outcomes. Major donor states, including the United States, lack access to reasonable, you know, reasonably detailed, reliable reports and information made available by these single country trust funds, as well as the outcomes and results stemming from United Nations activities. How is the United States working to increase this transparency and getting these nations to reveal where they're being funded behind the scenes so we can actually get to who's really you know, the money base behind them? Representative Tenney, your, your questions are very important because we agree 100% that transparency um, and being able to understand how effective the UN is, what they are spending the money on, and what the outcomes are is really, really, really important. It's crucial for the U.S. taxpayer to understand that uh, for our contributions, but it's also crucial for us to understand it globally. Um, so one of the things that we have been doing is, is working very hard in each individual organization to make sure that we are placing competent, uh, uh, well-qualified folks in administrative structures who are pushing for that transparency. So, uh, for example, we just placed uh, the Deputy uh, Director General for IOM, the International Organization of Migrations, to mm -hmm. which we are the largest voluntary contributor, um, a, an American citizen who has long experience in that area, uh, a, in the new DDG spot for administration, so that we can better track not just the input of our can, dollars, can I just but like, the outcome. In, just reclaim my time for a second. How exactly are you tracking that, though? And what, what mechanisms are being put in place so we can actually track it other than just uh, overseeing it and saying, we're hoping you comply? I mean, is there actually some type of uh, transactional uh, investigation that we're doing to make sure that they report? And, and, and I'm, I'm curious about that. Just briefly, if you will, because I have another important question. Absolutely. Each UN organization is required to, to submit annual reports. Some of them are much better and more transparent than others, and we are pushing for a greater level of transparency in all those reports so that we can track this stuff better. Could we, is there a system in place where we can verify those? reports so that we know that what they're actually submitting is actually accurate? Is there like a, a, like a, a way that we can do that? E each agency has its own uh, uh, office of investigations if we believe there, there is you know, malfeasance or something going on. Uh, but as I said, part of what we, we are doing is making sure that the personnel who are providing those reports have the integrity and the qualifications to make sure that they are quality reports coming out that we can trust. Great, thank you. And now I just wanted to bring up Ranking Member McCall has introduced legislation that would codify the Office of Multilateral Strategy and Personnel, otherwise known as MSP. That bill, uh, the United Nations Transparency and Accountability Act, would establish clear duties for the office and, and empower the head of MSP to coordinate all nominations for election to the UN system. It would also require an increase in JPO slots of not less than 50% ensuring Americans have the same access to UN employment as other countries. What is the I.O. Bureau's position on R.M. McCall's, or Ranking Member McCall's proposal? Would this legislation assist you in your ongoing efforts at state? Thank you. Uh, we have seen the legislation uh, from Representative McCall, and we look forward to continued discussions with this committee and with his office on that. Um, many elements of the draft legislation are already underway, including, as you noted, the establishment of the Office of Multilateral Strategy and Personnel. And we've appreciated the frequent opportunities to talk with his staff and staff of this committee um, about this evolving effort. Um, we think that anything that supports U.S. involvement in U.N. institutions is helpful. Thank okay, you. So do you think that you can get to the 50 percent or any aspect of that in the, in the legislation? We would hope to see the funding uh, for that uh, okay. as we go forward. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Representative. All right, that's all. I think everybody so far for first round questions. We'll go through for any quick second round questions. Uh, members, if you have second round questions, please let us know. 
Uh, don't feel like you have to ask a question, but uh, if you've got one, we'll go through right now for a quick second round, all right? Um, all right, I wanted to start with myself. I've got one more question and wanted to ask you about the election for the International Labor Organization. Uh, in March 2022, the International Labor Organization will elect its new Director General after the retirement of Guy Ryder from the United Kingdom. There are candidates from Australia, Togo, South Africa, France, and South Korea. And the ILO plays a key role in setting international labor standards, and the United States, of course, has strong interests in front of that body. Uh, what are the State Department's priorities at the ILO, and how is that aligned with your strategy for these upcoming elections? And what are you gonna do to ensure that the State Department has a coordinated strategy with other agencies, especially the Department of Labor, and with labor unions and other civil society groups to approach this election. Thank you. We agree that this is a critical election, and we have been working already with the Department of Labor uh, and, and with others, uh, both in the private sector as well as in the in the union movement, to make sure that we are giving everybody an opportunity to interview each of the candidates. Uh, I met just yesterday with the ROK candidate. I, I have met with the French and the Australian candidate and look forward next month to meeting with the Togolese candidate. And we're working hard to make sure that they get around. Um, we are also pleased that there is going to be more transparency in this election and that there is going to be uh, a panel discussion that will be live and open to everybody on the internet uh, to see those uh, candidates give their uh, vision for the ILO. Um, but we will be coordinating uh, the U.S. government's uh, uh, voting, and we will be working uh, to make sure that we are working with the labor unions and the private sector representatives uh, on that uh, on this election as it goes forward. Uh, thank you. I'll go now to Ranking Member Maliotakis. As we discussed earlier, the United Nations is the, the United States is the largest financial contributor to the United Nations, paying roughly one quarter of both the regular and peacekeeping budgets. Um, my first question is, do you believe our influence in the United Nations system reflects our financial contributions? And then the second part of that question is, despite some success by the United States, the UN still lacks the appropriate levels of financial transparency and reporting on outcomes. Major donor states, including the United States, lack access to reasonably detailed, viable information on the use of funding made available through single country trust funds, as well as the outcomes and results stemming from the United Nations activities. Uh, how can we as Congress um, ensure that we're working to to increase this transparency. You have any suggestions there? Thank you. Uh, the, we agree that the level of transparency on single country trust funds needs to be much improved. Um, we are concerned about these trust funds and we are concerned that some countries, uh, in particular the People's Republic of China, have been using them to push uh, their own agendas and their own foreign, single nation foreign policy agendas. This is particularly true in the case of the Belt and Road Initiative um, and the newly launched GDI, uh, the Global Development Initiative. We have uh, worked with UN agencies to which these trust funds have been aimed. Uh, including the UN Development Program and UNICEF in particular, um, to push for greater transparency of how those funds are being used, uh, both in their programmatic documents and in their outcome documents and reporting. We will continue to do that, and we are committed to making sure that that is the case. And any suggestions from on what Congress can do to just push for more accountability and transparency when it comes to monies that are being put into any of these, any of these international organizations to measure the metrics, but also to ensure that it's being used properly. I, I have to say, uh, Madam Representative, that, that one of the best things that, that Congress has enabled us to do is set up this IOMSP office because we are very focused on data analytics as part of this office and your continuing support for us to be able to have that data analytics um, unit um, established and grow will allow us to have greater transparency and is really, really important as we go forward because we have to have modern data capturing techniques in order to make sure that we are, we are tracking this stuff. And we agree with you that transparency is absolutely critical. And if these organizations aren't being transparent, um, how, how are you doing these analytics? 
One of the things that we are able to do because we are uh, the largest contributor in many cases, both voluntary and assessed funding to these organizations, yeah, is to go in and actually demand that transparency from them to ask for reporting uh, and to make sure that that is coming to us in a regularized fashion. Um, and we have been doing that. Um, it is not as consistent as we would like across the board, and so this is something that that office will also be able to track, is to say, where are we not getting that kind of reporting so that we can make sure that we're able to track it. Have you, to date, identified any um, disturbing misuse of funds? I apologize, I didn't hear the question. To date, has this uh, analytics department been able to identify any particular misuse of funds? As we're just setting up the office, we only hired the first people about six weeks ago. Um, we, we have not yet been able to do that reporting, but we look forward to being able to do a better job of tracking that kind of issue. There have been reports um, uh, issued by offices of inspector generals yes. across the UN system, and when those reports come out, we do investigate those. Okay, and when do you expect your initial reports to be disseminated? Uh, we hope to be able to have this office of this unit within the office of IOMSP up and fully functional within the next year. Um, we're just getting started and we have to build out the databases for tracking before we're able to do that. And what do you think maybe some of your priorities for the, once it's up and running? Where will you be focusing most of your attention? Any particular organization or just? Uh, we, we will be focusing our attention uh, in large part in areas where, uh, where we are the single largest contributor um, as priorities at, at the first go, but then also in organizations where we haven't had the level of transparency that we would like. Um, and then also on elections, because this office will also be building out uh, election uh, tracking devices, and we think that that is critically important, because if you don't have the right people in, the, in place, uh, you know, you're not gonna get the kind of transparency you want. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member. We'll go now to Vice Chair Jacobs. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for allowing us a, a second round. Um, we know that international organizations are incredibly diverse in terms of the topics and regions that they touch. Uh, the U.S. agencies and even parts of the State Department that deal with them stretch across the entire government. Um, for instance, uh, according to a recent CSIS report, 23 different parts of the U.S. government provide, provide funding to different IOs. And in certain circumstances, there's overlap even within the same I.O., such as both USAID and Treasury provide staff to the World Bank and, and OECD receives funding from five different agencies. So this obviously seems like a huge challenge in interagency coordination. Um, what kind of interagency coordinating mechanism exists to ensure our policies are synchronized with the whole of government strategy? Uh, and if one does not exist, do you think uh, there should be one? Thank you very much. It, it, it is a diverse and broad uh, funding base, but also a diverse and, and broad uh, policy base. So the Bureau of International Organization Affairs and the State Department has the lead on international uh, organizations and multilateral affairs throughout uh, the entire U.S. government. And we regularly convene in conjunction with our colleagues at the NSC, um, IPCs, uh, Interagency Policy Committees, uh, to discuss policies, but also to discuss coordination. Uh, on these efforts. Uh, when it comes to elections and appointments, we have the lead, um, and our office, uh, the new, this new office that we've set up, um, is enabling us to have the resources and the personnel to do that in a much more rigorous and coordinated fashion across the government, um, within the State Department, and across the interagency, and we will are committed to continuing that effort. Well, thank you, and I, I wanna talk about this uh, Office of Multilateral Strategy. Um, I know we talked about it in the last question, um, and you just mentioned it. Um, moving forward, how will IO and the new office um, coordinate with regional and functional bureaus that handle specific IOs that fall within those regional or functional bureaus jurisdictions? Will each bureau have a person responsible for coordinating with IO on strategy? So I'll take one example. Our uh, economics uh, bureau uh, works very closely with the OSCE, and there is a person who is designated in that office with whom we coordinate on OSCE policy, but on, also on personnel. Um, so uh, we have a very tight coordination effort already uh, in that instance. Uh, in other areas, it has been less tight, and we are working to tighten that up. 
Okay, well, I will look forward to seeing progress uh, on that uh, tightening. Um, I want to uh, also ask a, a little bit about down ballot races. I know we've talked a lot about some of the marquee races coming up, like ITU, ILO. Um, but where are there down ballot races and what are you doing to prepare for those? I know, for instance, ITU has several down ballot races in addition to the secretary general one. Um, and, and what are you doing and what more can be done? And do you have the authorities and resources you need to be able to do that? Yes, it's very important because not only the leadership of these organizations, but the, the numbers two, three, fours, and, and the folks who are in charge of administration are very, very important. So one of the things that we have done is set up a tracking table, um, uh, which we are then go, uh, going to put into our databases as we go forward um, to look not only at the leadership level races, uh, but down into the deputy, uh, uh, deputy director general level and then the assistant deputy director general level so that we are looking across uh, these organizations. Um, right now, we're still building that out, um, but we're hopeful that we will be able to track that trend over time that will give us greater granularity so that we can not only track these elections, but then work ahead of time uh, to put good candidates in place, whether Americans or from like-minded countries and partners. Wonderful. Well, thank you again so much, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll give you one minute and 15 seconds back. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Issa. I'll take the minute. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when, when we left off on the first round, I had asked about tools available or that you felt you could use going forward to protect Taiwan from this ongoing aggression, Taiwan and the other neighbors from this ongoing aggression. Uh, do you believe that the United Nations has a role? And if so, how would you uh, begin the process of getting them to provide some pushback uh, 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 to China's continued aggression? I think the UN has a role in any case where there is uh, peace and security uh, at stake. And I think that it is important uh, for the UN to speak out, and we have urged them to speak out, for instance, where there are examples of gross human rights abuses um, perpetrated by the People's Republic of China, whether that's in Tibet, whether that's in Hong Kong, or whether that's in Xinjiang. We have also urged the UN uh, to include Taiwan uh, where appropriate uh, in, in it bring its expertise and its, uh, its experience uh, to bear. So, on things like supply chains, on things like international civil aviation safety, on uh, disease prevention. They did a great job, at, especially at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, not only in identifying uh, the DNA uh, uh, sequencing, but also developing their own vaccine and monitoring and keeping their population safe. So we need to continue to push the UN to include them, uh, include their expertise, uh, but also to address where the People's Republic of China is not taking into account international safety and security um, in its own policies. Okay. Uh, and then the last part, uh, there's been a lot of discussion, uh, always will be, about how the UN gets uh, interfaces with such programs, as you said, of the Chinese uh, initiative Belt and Road. Uh, we have a number of agencies, the uh, Trade Development Agency, uh, obviously USAID, that give essentially free grants uh, outside the UN to help in development. Uh, well, China basically does its development as a profit center, as a, uh, a tool uh, of expanding their influence and uh, then leverages the United Nations funding and personnel uh, for that agenda. How are you specifically going to be able to stop China from essentially both profiteering in their port uh, takeovers and so on, uh, but, but most specifically from using UN resources uh, to further leverage their already robust uh, program under Belt and Road? Yeah, the, the, this is an area where we have a long-standing uh, and, and I think strong bipartisan uh, agreement that, that we need to do everything we can to push back on the Chinese effort to undermine uh, international institutions, international norms, 
through using these kind of programs like the Belt and Road. Ambassador, I just want to interrupt it. Yes, to please. Steer, steer the question a little bit. The last administration for four years failed in that effort. So uh, I agree that it has been multi-party, uh, it has been multi-presidential. I was actually looking at what new initiatives could be taken since, you know, in the last administration, there was talk about it, uh, certainly a lot of robust talk about it, but the record of accomplishment uh, as, a, as a Republican and a Trump supporter, the record of accomplishment isn't there. So what can we do that didn't work last time? Because obviously this is still an ongoing problem. Part of what we are working on is uh, uh, combining with uh, our, uh, um, the DFC, uh, the Development Finance Corporation and other U.S. government institutions to put forward a proactive and positive agenda that pushes forward American values because it's hard to fight something with nothing. We think it's important that we show up, that we compete, and that we uh, work with developing countries um, to make sure that they have sound investments that benefit them and that benefit us, not that just benefit China. And we will continue to do that. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I will yield back my 15 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Issa. We'll go now to uh, Representative Tenney. Thank you, and thank you for staying on longer. And this is uh, actually similar to the question that uh, Mr. Issa had. And obviously, we know that China engages in attempts to rewrite the international order to drive their agenda in various ways that were incited by Mr. Issa. You know, one of my concerns is that, that China steals anywhere from $350 billion to $400 billion in intellectual property. And, and in order to facilitate that, they try to change the rules at the World Intellectual Property Organization. They try to exclude Taiwan from the World Health Organization uh, and even the International Civil, Civil Aviation Organization, which is interesting, obviously, for Taiwan being a, a country that is surrounded by water. But to, uh, to more to Mr. Ice's point, and I agree with him, you know, we really haven't been effective at countering China. What can we do uh, now, now that we know what it's in place? And I think the administration is, is sort of projecting to China that you're just a competitor. Isn't it, shouldn't we be taking China more seriously than just a competitor, that really a world uh, hegemon who wants to take over with their 100-year strategy, their Belt and Road Initiative, and as Mr. Ice has cited, you know, profiting off of the use of our money, almost leveraging our money uh, that, that, we, that we give uh, so much to the UN. How do we counter that and how do we hold them accountable? And what, like real quickly, what strategies does the ad administration have in viewing them as not just a competitor, but a world dominator that is really going to have negative implications for the world, not just the United States going forward? The, the, we take very seriously uh, not just the the competition piece, but also the the potential for uh, for uh, a very aggressive uh, uh, competition that could lead uh, into very bad situations in the future. Um, so we are working very hard one to make sure that security it, our security is strong, two that our allies and their security is strong, but also um, really working at how do we uh, keep uh, the PRC's efforts, which I equate to kind of the tide over time. It's not a big tidal wave, it's the gradual undermining of the foundations upon which these institutions are built, mm -hmm. which have served our interests and served global peace and security interests over the last 70, 80 years that we need to preserve and we need to fight for. So that means we need to be present, it means that we need to be looking at what they're doing on language, but also really scrutinizing and shining a light on what they're doing on funding. Um, so we agree with you. Mm -hmm. Light is something that they do not want on what they are doing, and we need to be very public about shining a light on wh what they are doing and why they're doing it um, so that other countries understand why it's not in their interest to go down this road. Right. Um, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And other than just obviously shining the light, transparency, all those things are important, what type of uh, rule changes can we make to really emphasize and project that we aren't fooling around. You know, we are serious. We want to make sure they understand that we are not going to accept their dominance and their attempt to dominate other countries. So what can we do in terms of rule changes within your organization to really put, uh, you know, some pressure on them uh, strategically and also to make sure that not just the United States, but other countries on the world aren't leveraged and in such a vulnerable position because they have great economic strength. They use, uh, you, know, uh, you know, basically a kind of economic espionage the way that they go through to these countries and manipulate them. How, what could we do specifically in terms of rule changes 
at your level to make this uh, not just shining a light, not just transparent, but really uh, you know, digging in and having some, some real guardrails for them? Guardrails is the right word. Mm -hmm. um, we need to make sure that, that the rules of the road in international organizations that have sustained global peace for generations are, are maintained and sustained. That's first and foremost. Secondly, uh, the transparency issues that you've already, we've already discussed. And third, we need to make sure that, that we are present, we are leading, and that we are working very strongly with not only our traditional allies, but with countries which have been unfortunately vulnerable to exploitation um, because they're just, not in, in the strongest positions. And I agree. When you say present, when you mean you know just basically making sure that we are in, in regions where we have a, a stake or where other countries have a stake or where China is over exceeding its, its norms, exceeding our, our view of international norms, for example, moving into Afghanistan or Serbia and other areas to try to you know, take, take over resources there. Uh, it, it, it's being present not only regionally, but also in international institutions. For okay. example, in UNESCO, where the ethics of artificial intelligence uh, norms are being set up right now, we are not present. If we were present, we would have a voice at that table. We need to be present across the board to make sure that we are influencing those efforts, not only for now, but for the future. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the extra time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Representative Tenney, and that concludes our testimony and our questions, and I want to make closing remarks in just a second. But before I do, just want to give a shout out to one of our staff members, Zach Keck, who's going to be leaving us to go to the Department of Defense. Uh, he's done incredible work with us for a few years. Just want to say thank you, Zach, for all of your work. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us for this subcommittee hearing. And one of the reasons that we have to remain engaged, Ambassador, as you know, consistent with your testimony, one of the reasons we have to remain engaged in international organizations is to set global standards around a host of issues, including human rights. We were reminded of this in recent weeks after Chinese tennis star Pong Sha went missing after accusing a close ally of Xi Jinping of sexually assaulting her. After weeks of outcry about her whereabouts, the PRC media released an email to WA Chairman and CEO Steve Simon claiming to be from Pong which many su suspect is of dubious authenticity. We're best able to combat human rights abuses, including by the PRC, by engaging in international organizations and setting global standards around issues like human rights and many other issues as well. And that's why this work matters. Uh, the members of the sub subcommittee no doubt will reflect on all the testimony we heard today as we pursue our legislative and oversight responsibilities on the United States engagement with the United Nations and other international organizations. And I'm happy to see that there's strong bipartisan support for the State Department's work to advance our influence within the United Nations. And there's a lot Congress can do, including providing the department with the authorities and funding needed to do this great work. But by far, the most immediate thing that Congress, and more specifically, the United States Senate, can do is to quickly confirm Ambassador Michelle Sisson to be the Assistant Secretary of State for International Organization Affairs. It's been five months since her hearing at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but the actions of Senator Ted Cruz from my home state of Texas and Senator Josh Howley have held up her confirmation. This unreasonable blockade has also held up a number of other nominees who have cleared the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, including Captain Sully Sullenberger, to the International Civil Aviation Organization, Bruce Turner to the Conference on Disarmament, uh, Jack Markell to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Laura Holgate to the Vienna Office of the United Nations and the IAEA, uh, Sheba Crocker to the Geneva Office of the United Nations, Lisa Carty to the UN's Economic and Social Council, uh, Chris Liu to the UN, the United Nations for Management and, Re Management and Reform, and Julianne Smith to NATO. I know my counterparts in the Senate, Democrats and Republicans both, share my frustration at the actions of their colleagues. Senators Cruz and Hawley's continued actions have left a vacuum in U.S. influence abroad and are hurting our foreign policy. I hope they realize the serious consequences of their actions and allow for these nominees to be voted on as soon as possible. Uh, thank you all, and with that, this hearing is adjourned.